Good afternoon and welcome to today's EHS Today webcast. Safety Lockout System, an Alternative Method for Lockout Tagout, sponsored by PILS Automation Safety. My name is Stephanie Valentic, Associate Editor of EHS Today. Before we begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First, if at any time you are having audio difficulties or slides are not advancing, simply hit your F5 key to refresh your webcast console. If you have any technical difficulties during today's session, please press the Help button on your player console to receive assistance in solving common issues. This webinar technology allows you to resize the presentation by clicking the Maximize icon or by dragging the lower right corner to enlarge the window. We welcome your questions during today's event. In order to submit your questions to today's presenter, simply type your question into the question window on the left side of your screen and hit Submit. We'll be answering as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that follows the main presentation. But feel, please feel free to send in your questions at any time and we'll add them to the queue. Please also be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the EHS Today website within the next week for you to review. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. On your council, the PILS logo is hotlinked. If you want to visit their website during this webcast, you can click on the logo and a new window will open. This will not take you out of the event. I would now like to introduce our speakers. Mike Kanata is a Regional Sales Manager for PILS. He has a degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of Dayton and is a Certified Machinery Safety Expert. He has 30 years of experience selling and supporting products and services in industrial automation applications. He has over 10 years of experience in safety automation for PILS Automation Safety. Tim Huss is a Project Engineer for PILS. He has over 34 years of experience in safety control in safety control related environment and is a certified machinery safety expert. He was instrumental in developing the PILS SLS and continues to be highly involved in customer installations. He has over 10 years of experience in safety consulting and safety system design and implementation for PILS automation safety. Welcome Mike and Tim. Thanks Stephanie. Appreciate everybody taking the time today to join this webinar and hopefully it's a little nicer weather where you're at than windy and rainy and turning the snow as is here in Cleveland, Ohio. So, But uh, we'll get into it here and talk about the uh, safe lockout system and an alternative isolation method for lockout tagout. So some of our objectives today are to review the challenges with manual disconnects, discuss some of the concerns using a contactor as an isolator, discuss UL 6420 and how it applies to equipment used for system isolation, talk about what is a safe lockout system or safety isolation equipment, and then discuss some of the other standards that recognize safety isolation equipment. So traditional isolating device challenges, essentially uh, disconnect switches, manual operator disconnect switches are typically designed for 8,000 operations. Some larger amperage versions, over 600 amps, are rated at only 2,000 operations. Now there are frequent use AC23A rated disconnect switches, which can provide 20,000 operations at lower amperages, typically 30 and 60 amp. However, you have to consider that one operation is considered a single throw of the switch. So therefore, a normal off, lock, then unlock and turn back on would be two operations. So the numbers that you see on the slides, of, you know, in the sentences above would have to essentially be, uh, you know, cut in half for a cycle, a typical lockout tagout cycle. Over a 20 year mission life for which modern safety systems are designed, this would yield less than two on off cycles per day for an AC23A rated manual disconnect switches or a switch that is not rated AC23A or higher amperage switches, that could be significantly less than one operation per day. And I'm sure everybody might have applications where their use of a lockout switch is significantly more frequent than that. Traditional isolating device challenges, uh, some other things to consider is when performing a lockout, it is necessary to verify a zero energy state before performing a task. This can prove difficult, and PPE is required to perform these voltage measurements. Washdown and food grade environments 
are especially dangerous when high power disconnects are at machine access points in wet locations. Also, you have to consider that after a power failure, a manual disconnect stays on, leaving the potential for hazardous energy to be present when power is reapplied. Series connected disconnects for multiple access points can lead to false zero voltage verification because of a disconnect upstream may be off. So in this case, turning off a local disconnect may indicate no power. However, if that disconnect failed while being turned off, it could still be locked and the failure is undetected. When the upstream disconnect is turned back on, the failed switch will not isolate the energy properly and this could lead to a safe, unsafe condition. Disconnects, as we just mentioned, can fail to an unsafe condition. The operator is required to stand in front or to the side of the door to throw the lever, putting them in harm's way if there's a fault. Phases may remain energized even when locked out. And as you can see in the picture, there's a lock on the handle, but A and B phase are still energized. So some applications use a visual window to verify the position of the blades. But studies have shown this to be unreliable as operators become complacent and subconsciously notice one blade out and ignore the position of the other phases. And this probably happened to other people. It happened to me recently in an email I read. I missed a word in the email and it totally changed the meaning of the email. And uh, so, you know, again, you know, it's subconscious, but it can happen. And so, again, studies have shown that that is not necessarily a reliable method of verifying that uh, the switch operated properly. Regardless, if a switch fails, safe or unsafe, replacing the switch is an inherently dangerous task and often needs to be done every two to three years in frequent use applications. Clearance in front of a disconnect of 36 inches is in front of a disconnect enclosure is required. Arc flash hazards to the disconnect operator Maybe it may also be present, and our flash PPE is required, and operators tend to stand in front of the switches and operate with the right hand. More people are right-handed than left-handed, and all the switches, though, have the disconnect handle on the right-hand side. So. so using a contactor as an isolator. So a contactor system is optimal for high cycle rates, but is not a disconnect isolating device unless it's AC 23A rated as a unit. So normally, you can see this IEC standard 60947-4-1 that allows a contactor to tack weld closed as long as it can be broken free, broken free easily. So if you consider that and you consider a common cause failure in a dual contactor arrangement, both contactors can weld on the same phase when subject to a fault current. This might be okay for inhibiting motion in a typical guard door interlock application, but not for energy isolation. To meet ISO 13849 dual channel requirements, the system would have to be tested for this common cause failure to qualify for safe energy isolation. Another fact to consider is that normal contactor endurance testing per the IEC standard, requires six times rated current. However, disconnect AC23A requires 10 times rated current, almost twice and almost twice the cycle count. So it's a lot higher standard than what contactors are normally subject to. So this kind of gets to why the system needs to be tested as a complete system and certain contactors need to be evaluated and what have you and, and used with a safe lockout system. So having mentioned that, there's a standard, UL 6420, covers controls and contactors as an isolator. So the standard applies to isolating equipment, incorporating electromechanical contactors, remotely controlled and monitored to provide remote isolation status indication with a defined integrity level. System isolation equipment is used both as a means for removal of power for the prevention of unexpected startup of a machine, of a stop machine, as well as 
an isolator to provide protection from electric shock by ensuring the removal of electrical energy, such as lockout-tagout. This equipment is intended for installation in accordance with the National Electric Code, NFPA 79, and the Electrical Standard for Industrial Machinery, NFPA 79, 2012. The system isolation equipment is principally intended for industrial machine applications where the isolation of power is so frequently required that the mechanical life of a typical disconnecting means, and we can remember what we saw in the typical operations of a uh, disconnect switch, is unacceptably short, or where there are multiple entry points on a machine where disconnection is required, or both of the above. In 2015, OSHA added the ANSI UL6420 for product approvals by a nationally recognized testing laboratory, or NERDL, as it's sometimes referred to. And you can reference OSHA 1910.7 for that. UL6420 provides that the system isolation equipment can also be configured to meet additional machine control interface applications, such as guard door lock status, release signal for guard door locks, the signal to and feedback from safety pneumatic control valves, signal from e-stop devices and feedback from e-stop systems, the run permissive to a machine drive control system, zero speed signals from a drive or another type of zero speed monitoring, signal to the machine stop. Also, information-related interface channels can include lockout switch positions, whether they're open or closed, isolation system component status and troubleshooting aids, and isolation system equipment status. So the safe lockout system, what is it? So the safe lockout system, or SLS, is a system to safely disconnect machines and facilities from electrical, hydraulic, and pneumatic power and provide automatic energy verification in order to protect personnel and comply with industry standards to prevent unexpected startup. The power isolation is a control reliable design and uses dual channel circuitry in the disconnect path. The concept is the same as lockout tagout procedure with an automatic verification. No light, no enter. The light is 24 volts, so that's not hazardous energy. UL6420, system isolation equipment approved, the PILS system may be used as an isolation disconnect means for electrical servicing per NEC 430.109 and NFPA 79-2012. And we'll show some other references to standards uh, later in the presentation. The energy isolation systems are modular in design. You have a main panel, you have an optional panel or remote interface subpanel. You have a safety PLC, then you have the remote lockout switches. You have optional pneumatic exhaust dump valves and also optional hydraulic exhaust dump valve interfaces. And here is a schematic of a system and we'll go through a lot more pictures which will explain in a little more detail. But you can see on the left-hand side, you have three remote lockout switches. Internally in the safe lockout system, you have a safety controller, you have redundant contactors, and a safe voltage monitor. And also you have optional e-stops coming into the system, other safety stops, as well as redundant valves, um, maybe from a dual uh, feedback system for pressure switches. So here's another picture of that similar concept with some actual pictures of remote lockout stations. Again, on the left you can have, it shows eight lockout stations going into a marshalling panel. And the main unit, the power and control panel, can handle either four or eight remote lockout stations, depending on the size of the unit. And you can see here the 4E volt power coming in, and then the isolated uh, or load power going out. And again, we have a couple slides coming up that will show this even better. Um, and then you have your pneumatic isolation panels or hydraulic isolation panels. As well, you have Ethernet communication for fault and system status, and this can be you know, Modbus TCP, Ethernet IP, um, you know, several different uh, industrial communication networks. So this is what the 
PILT's SLS panel looks like, a picture of one, and what's in inside it. You'll see you have field terminations, and then you have an incoming power disconnect. Now, this disconnect here is only for servicing, so it's not turned on and off every time the unit cycled or what have you. That's the power contactors that are below that that are turned on and off each time the unit's cycled. You have a safety controller, and then we have a three-phase safety-rated voltage monitor, and that's called the PILS PU3Z. So that's essentially what's inside a PILS safety lockout system. And then you have your remote lockout stations. A system isolated light will illuminate once removal of hazardous energy has been verified. And you'll see you have a lockable isolation switch here that you turn off and then you wait for that light to come on. And the light will either come on almost immediately or if you're waiting for a zero speed monitor or something like that, it might be delayed in coming on because, again, you have maybe a standstill or zero speed monitor that uh, is signaling to the safety PLC. Hydraulic and pneumatic isolation standard is being worked on and will be added to UL 6420 in the future. The plug in pneumatic panel with inlet pressure switch and dual calibrated pressure, zero pressure factory tested verification switches is provided for isolation to ISO 13849 1, category 4, performance level E. For now, OSHA will allow use of these hydraulic or pneumatic or pneumatic panels, I should say, for operator tasks and minor servicing exceptions for the prevention of unexpected startup. Here's some pictures of the actual panels. You'll see there's wall mount systems that are 60, 100, and 200 amp. And then we also have a 200 amp floor mount version, as well as a 400 and 600 amp shown here. And there is also a design for an 800 amp system as well. So some advantages of system isolation equipment. Safe disconnect isolation of machine or zone hazardous energy. The prevention of unintended startup, because if power is lost and the power comes back on, a start signal would be needed to allow power to return to the machine, since, uh, again, the contactors would be open until a start signal is given. Zero energy verification and visual acknowledgement of the safe state so there's no need to suit up in arc flash gear for zero voltage verification. A long lifetime compared to traditional disconnect switches. They're designed for a high cycle frequency and a 20 year mission life. Remote operation removes the operator from the power switching elements. They're only standing in front of a little small disconnect that only has 24 volts in it. Also, you gotta consider the cost of running six conductor 16 gauge tray rated cable for 24 volts is much less expensive for these remote lockout stations than placing a disconnect switch at a convenient access point where you would have to run copper power wires and conduit. Electrical and fluid power isolation with a single remote lockout station. So just one lock needed to do electrical as well as the fluid power isolation. Also, economical placement of lockout points at each access location promotes using proper procedures. As well, flexible configuration for large and diverse machines and facilities. Clearance of 36 inches in front of the remote lockout station is not needed because, again, it's only 24 volts low current. Also, this removes the operator from hazards associated with washdown environments by removing the presence of 480 volts at the access point. As well, another advantage of system isolation equipment is cost savings. So if you consider the cost of replacing disconnect switches every few years in a frequent use application, also the labor and inherent danger in doing so, replacing those switches. Also, if you consider the additional cost labor of labor and downtime to go to a disconnect that might be located way up in a mezzanine or down in a basement, um, and the time needed to gear up and put the arc flash gear on to conduct the voltage verification, all those go away with the use of a safety isolation, a system isolation equipment. So a dual contactor system is not 
an isolation device unless proven through a third party lab testing as a unit. So this some points of a clarification here essentially. This needs to be done and to an accepted standard and UL 6420 is that standard. Now some points of clarification again that I wanted to make on this is all the components that you saw in that panel that I showed previously, those are all you know readily available. You can buy a safety controller, you can buy contactors, safety rated contactors, you can buy um, a three-phase safety voltage monitor from us and what have you, and you can put all that together in a panel. But when it's not rate done, is rated as a system. So again, all the standards point to everything being rated as a system and tested as a system. And keep in mind um, that again, that's what we've we've done with this system, and um, the systems are sealed and only to be serviced by a trained, qualified personnel. And we do have training programs and things like that as well to again qualify personnel at a, at a plant to uh, be trained to do servicing on that. So. The National Electric Code uh, accepts SLS for energy isolation, as you can see here on uh, 430.2, system isolation equipment, a redundant, monitored, remotely operated contactor isolation system, packaged to provide the disconnection isolation function capable of verifiable operation from multiple remote locations, each having capability of being padlocked in the off or open position. And again, 430.109, System isolation equipment shall be listed for disconnection purposes. So again, that's where the UL 6420 comes in. NFPA 79, um, also devices for disconnecting isolating equipment. And if you look at the third one down there under 5.5.4, system isolation equipment that incorporates control lockout stations and is listed for disconnection purposes. And again, we're located on the load side. These are always located on the load side of the main supply as well as uh, the overcurrent protection. So they're located after the main supply and the overcurrent protection. So you'll see here also an ANSI Z244.1 and 3.1.2. You can see that system isolation equipment that incorporates control lockout stations and is, again, listed for disconnection purposes. And again, also points out where it's located on the load side of the main and the overcurrent uh, protection. And then now below that, 8.4.4, remote activated electromechanical lockout systems are an acceptable alternative to be used in selected applications such as long machines and inaccessible inconvenient locations or for primary isolation devices. The user shall install and operate such systems in accordance with the manufacturer's directions. And also, um, then also they mentioned Annex B uh, for NFPA 79 for additional information. And here's another area from 5.4.1 with regards to location. And down in the subnote here, they talk about a remote lockout system isolation equipment rated as a unit and listed for such for the purpose of isolating energy may be implemented as one such measure. And then they refer you to Annex B, which we'll come to next. So here in Annex B, you'll see justification to use remote lockout system instead of a manual disconnect for service disconnect isolation purposes. Includes when frequency of the task exceeds the capability of the manual disconnect, when the environment is not acceptable to place a manual disconnect, so a wet location, when there's large complicated machinery involving many lockout devices making the lockout procedure too cum cumbersome, to reduce a single lock point directly at the access point, so again, for the convenience of placing these right at the access point, to prevent machine operators from standing in front of large disconnect switches in case of short circuit fault. Again, that's where the arc flash fault could happen and you know, arc flash gear may be required and what have you. This takes that away. As well as large disconnect can, can be physically hard to operate for some operators. I've heard this on more than one occasion. Um, you know, some larger disconnects can actually be uh, pretty hard to operate, and if they're doing that multiple times a day, um, that's not necessarily um, a task that uh, operators really should be doing. Um, required spaces are not available, so service access, electrical hazards, adequate vent ventilation might not be available. So these are some of the reasons, um, you know, that electrical lockout systems um, can be used. So I guess just a summary, um, 
Safe lockout systems can improve safety. Safe lockout systems can save money. Safe lockout systems, however, are not for every application. However, for applications with multiple disconnects, long production lines with multiple lockout points, or frequent lockout requirements, they can be just right. Sales Automation Safety would be glad to discuss your application to see if a safe lockout system is the right fit. We also have a white paper on this subject that goes into a lot of detail, and that's available on request. And that concludes my part of the presentation. I thank you for your attention, and we'll move forward to the question and answer session. Okay. Um, a few of you have already submitted questions, so we're going to jump right in. Um, while the presenters are answering the questions, please take a moment to complete the feedback form that appears on the left side of your screen. All right. When you say that the system is sealed, what do you mean by that? Is the system physically sealed? Yes, the system is sealed tamper evident. Um, when the systems leave the factory, they have a factory seal on them. Uh, the concept is that if you have a problem, you would change it out on a component or module basis and not go inside and fix it. Um, but at the same time, we do train and certify end users to be qualified to break the factory seal. There's a procedure to uh, document what was done. You can only change components and fix the system. You cannot uh, modify it in any way or change the component parts to different models or anything. Um, so then, so essentially when you're trained and certified by PILS, you can break it, uh, document it, and reseal it yourself. Okay, um, what standards does the system mean? Does it meet CE, Australian, and Z standards? Uh, the system is designed to pass the CE mark. It has not been subjected in, uh, to actually get the CE mark because we have not had a customer request it. Um, let's see here. What means are taken to be sure that nobody can open the SLS cabinet and have access to contractors while workers are protected contactors while workers are protected by the SLS? There is uh, Lexan panels that cover up the whole power section. It allows you to connect your incoming power lines and your load lines on the output of the system. Uh, but other than that, there, uh, you would have to remove the Lexan panel, and on that panel is the uh, tamper-proof seals. Or not, it isn't really tamper-proof, it's tamper evident resistant. So um, you would have to break the seal to get in there. Um, and then if you're qualified, you can do that and you can document it. Um, if you're not qualified, then the system should not be used with broken seals. Can the system be used in a location where the area is sanitized using hydrogen peroxide as part of GMP environment? That is a new question. I would say contact pill sales and we can look into it. Uh, we do have 4X uh, boxes, remote lockout stations. I'm not sure about the peroxide. We would have to look into that. And it may be possible to do a custom enclosure if, if it's required. What is the size of the wall mount panels? That varies on the, uh, the different amperages, um, but it's uh, 32 by 48 for a 60 amp. Do the units work in hazardous atmospheres? I assume you're talking about explosion-proof atmospheres. Again, we have not had a customer request that, but we have thought about that as a possible uh, sales channel. 
Uh, we did look into at one time uh, some enclosures and things we could use for mounting the remote lockout station in the explosion-proof environment, and then have you know, of course, your switching would be done uh, outside of that zone. Um, we would not have power panels that could go in that environment. Please clarify on the use for pneumatic and hydraulic. Can it be used for full energy isolations per OSHA or only for minor servicing and operator tasks? Currently, the UL 6420 standard is for the electrical control section. Uh, it was released that way in order to not uh, have all the wrangling of uh, trying to release a standard with hydraulics and pneumatics as there are different specialists that would want to be involved in that part of the standard. Um, there is a new draft to add to the standard, the pneumatic isolation, and once that's added, we will add the hydraulics to the standard. So um, I would expect about six months from now we would have the pneumatics added and probably later this year or next year for hydraulics added to the standard. Is there an equivalent ISO or IEC standard defining SLS requirements? There is not. The UL 6420, when UL drafted the standard, they originally wanted to have IEC adopted into the 60947 standard, which is your contactors and disconnects and things. Um, but the IEC group did not want to take up the effort uh, so UL partnered with ANSI and had it uh, passed as an ANSI standard. But because it was written to try to go for IEC, it references all the IEC standards uh, for EMC and uh, temperature rise, endurance testing for contactors and disconnects, um, the AC23A rating testing, all that comes out of IEC standards. Um, I may have missed this, but can a door interlock be used instead of a lockout switch with the system for routine maintenance? If so, what are the advantages? Uh, you would use, typically they're used in conjunction with the door lock, but that's not part of the system, the isolation system. Uh, so the isolation system is designed to be a disconnect replacer. Uh, so, of course, your disconnect has nothing to do with a guard door switch. The standard allows our system to be integrated with the standard safety controls on a machine separately. So there is a separate connector on the panels to interface to your safety control system. could be anybody's safety PLC or relay-based system. And it provides the hooks to be able to do like an e-stop and open up our, pan, our contactors with an e-stop or with a guard door infringement or things like that. All that would be done in a in separate controller by who a, any end user can interface that part of it to our system. Um, but it's separate and it doesn't need to be tamper-proof any of that. That part of the control system doesn't need to have the same tamper-proof requirements. What is the actual legal requirement that states the system be third-party cert certified? Um, the OSHA NERDL program, National Recognized Testing Laboratory program, um, lists the standard um, in there and then a NERDL has to be approved for the standard. Um, can the pneumatic valves handle caustic and acidic gases? Could you repeat the question? Can the pneumatic valves handle caustic and acidic gases? Uh, the answer is no. It's designed for compressed air. Who are the listing agencies? Underwriter Laboratory is who does our certification uh, to the UL 6420 standard. 
what would be the main difference between the SLS and a standard safety control circuit built with redundant contactors on which a zero, a zero energy verification circuit would be added? A standard contactor is not tested to the uh, higher level and endurance that a disconnect is, is, um, is tested for. Um, so any products, when it's designed, has to go to a high-power test lab and get tested. For contactors, the IEC test requirement is to subject it to a short-circuit current fault, meaning you bolt together all three phases and you hit it with a certain high-current uh, fault uh, current. And for a normal contactor testing for type 2 coordination, it, it allows the contactors to tack weld. And it, uh, if you can go in and, say, take the auxiliary blocks off the side, put a screwdriver on the side, and break it free, then it passes that type 2 coordination. Type 2 coordination means that after that short circuit current fault, the device is still usable. Now, for the UL6420 standard, it references the same IEC contactor standard, but then it says, in addition, to the requirements, after the short circuit current fault, it cannot tack weld, and it has to be subjected to dielectric tests to make sure the isolation gap is still current. And in other words, it's not half shifted or stuck in stuck half shifted. Now, when we took our contactors to the high power test lab, uh, when we first had some designs, we had some some faults that didn't pass. And what we learned was the contactors always welded on the same phase because anytime you get a short circuit current fault, one of the three phases is always higher than the other three phases. So at the point you get the short circuit current fault, it wouldn't matter if you had five contactors in series, they would all weld on the same, um, on the same pole because the current was higher on that same pole at the time it happened. And every time that we failed, both contactors welded, not just one of them. So it's a common cause failure. And normally for unexpected startup, if you had a single phase condition um, where one of the three contacts welds, um, you would have a single phase available and a motor would not turn. So it prevents unexpected startup. But these systems are designed for energy isolation, so we cannot have uh, a contact weld. So it's the testing, the high power testing on the contactors that makes our system an energy isolation device using contactors. Do you know if using the SLS in Canada would be legal? I believe the equivalent to Z244 is 460, I believe. And it pretty much is a copy of the Z244, but the Z244 is new in 2016, so I don't know if Canada has adopted it yet. Uh, the old um, Z244 from 2003 that Canada copied, um, that did allow it. Uh, but most of the information was in the annex. And the 2016 Z244 moved it from an annex, which is not a requirement or, or part of the standard, it's just for information purposes. It moved the use of this system into the main body of, of the standard, and therefore the standard is actually calling for, and allowing for it. So I don't know exactly if Canada would uh, allow it or not. I do know we do not have 600 volt available and they have that up there. Uh, we can only go as far as 480 volts. Uh, we can go down as low as 400 volts or 380 volts. So it can be used in Europe and Russia and Asia where they have 380 volt, 50 hertz. It'll work on those systems, but not 600 volts. How many cycles are SLS systems designed to perform? The, it depends on the size and the contactor, but it goes anywhere from 20 million cycles uh, at uh, 
for the smaller sizes, uh, up to 3 million cycles for the larger 600 amp cycles. Does OSHA recognize AC-23A contactors as a lockout device? There is a issue with uh, OSHA um, not making up their minds and making a judgment on it. In other words, it's hard to get OSHA to change the standard. Um, so at this point, their actual regulation or law is, says no. Um, but at the same time, they accepted the the uh, UL standard into their national recognized testing um, program, and uh, we are certified to the standard. Could you specify what study is showing that workers are becoming less attentive to the verification of the standards disconnect? There was a standard done, uh, pills and, and P and G and Klockner Molar contactors invented the first system together uh, back in uh, like 1996, I believe it was. Um, and uh, um, it, there was, um, uh, could, could you repeat the question again? Um, can you specify what study shows workers are becoming less attentive to the verification of the standards disconnect? Oh, yeah, yeah, right. So it, um, as a basis for right for requesting the standard from UL, um, P&G commissioned a study from a third-party company and they did a review on disconnects. P&G kind of started all this by approaching molar and pills by saying, we have too many disconnects that are failing. Um, you could see in our presentation there was a disconnect. That picture came from P&G um, where the disconnect failed and there was a welded uh, bar on the disconnect. Um, so because they use disconnects for all tasks, including operator tasks, they have a lot of failures on disconnects. So they commissioned uh, a company, um, Batali, I think it was the name of it. Uh, if somebody wants to contact PILS, we can pass on that information. Uh, we don't have the, the complete report because P&G owns it. Um, they commissioned it. Um, but essentially the report looked at a number of disconnects and circuit breakers and it looked at the PILS system, the PILS uh, PG and molar system, um, and it looked at some other systems for energy isolation like there are circuit breakers that have a remote actuator on them like a solenoid operation and there are uh, some other uh, devices. Somebody had made a single contactor with a, and then had a voltage monitor on it. Um, and they looked at a number of remote lockout systems and they determined that the PILS, P&G, and Molar system um, was by far uh, a lot more safer when using it because it eliminates the procedures that um, are involved with manual disconnects. So you not only have the mechanical failure issue, but you also have um, um, issues with uh, the, the uh, procedures when you have multiple lockout systems and mistakes. Uh, so you, you, you forgot to lock out one of the sources and things like that. So the study took into consideration the complete lockout tagout procedure for a complicated machine and determined on a statistical basis that by far the PILS PNG molar system was the safest out of everything they looked at. Could the SLS system be used to protect workers doing electrical work on the machine? Currently, uh, OSHA, because they haven't changed their regulation, the UL 6420 brings you in compliance with NEC code. Uh, NFPA 79 and Z244 standards, which all allow its use if it's listed. 
um, OSHA has not changed their regulation um, at at this point. So um, officially for OSHA, it's unexpected startup um, for operator tasks or minor servicing. We do have a number of uh, users, most of them, that uh, also use it for some extended things, uh, such as grade changes and things like that. Um, uh, but that's a, a company basis, and it's based on the fact that we have hundreds of units out there since 1996, and it's proven in use. There has never been a uh, unsafe or, or a, a, a hazardous failure. There has never been, and there's never been an OSHA citation against any of our customers for using our system. Is the Lexan cover arc flash rated? It doesn't need to be arc flash rated um, because your your enclosure needs to be arc flash rated. Uh, it is UL compliant uh, plastic. You know, UL approved the systems um, and they looked into the type of plastic and everything. Um, so. Um, so it, it meets the requirements of UL electrical panels, yes. Are machine manufacturers incorporating these systems into new equipment? Could you repeat the question? Are machine manufacturers incorporating these systems into new equipment? Yes, we've sold about 200 systems since uh, our listing with the UL standard in 2016. Uh, we are currently active in installing uh, a number of systems uh, worldwide. We're shipping them to Russia, uh, Czech Republic, China, um, for large companies that are worldwide. So they incorporate them within their North American machines, and then they just want to ship them everywhere. So they're they're used they're used around the world, and we're very active in installing them at the moment. Would the SLS system meet NFPA 70E requirements for isolation? Again, it it uh, they're, they're the it has to do with the uh, listed or not listed, um, and they in the 2018 the um, 70E standard was updated. Um, because they had some of the engineers that sit on the standard had seen our system and they realized that the standard 70E said that you had to manually verify your voltage with a handheld meter. The 2018 version of 70E was changed now and it says that you can use a uh, safety voltage monitor if it's listed for that purpose. And so now the 70E does allow our systems because you can use that automatic verification, whereas in the past you had to uh, suit up and use your handheld voltmeter. How many RLS boxes can be used in an SLS system? There are two systems. The standard system is our uh, disconnect replacer that a customer can buy and install themselves. That system can have up to 64. And then we have a distributed system which PILS must do all the engineering and installation and start up on because they're custom and that one is pretty much unlimited. Do you have enclosures for food grade wash down environments? Yes, we have a 4X uh, RLS box. Uh, typically your power panels are going to be mounted back in a non wash down environment in your MCC room. Uh, so we don't have uh, 4X right now, but if someone wanted them, we could put the power panels in a 4X box also. Uh, but it is a good application uh, because you have wet 
environment and you're putting disconnects out on the floor and you're spraying them down for washing the equipment and uh, so by putting the uh, remote lockout box with 24 volts out there um, that, that eliminates you from interacting with the higher voltages. How many systems are in use in the market now? We have several hundred of the old systems prior to the UL listing that we've been selling since 1996. And in 2016, we have uh, the UL listed systems, and uh, we've sold several hundred of those so far. Um, do you have any final thoughts to add? Um, it, just, it looks like we're out of questions right now, so if you have any final questions, feel free to submit them. Um, and while we're waiting a minute here, if you'd like to add any final thoughts about this. Well, one thing I, I wanted to add was just that, uh, again, Tim, thank you for answering all those questions. And this is, uh, you know, can be a complex subject. And by all means, um, feel free to uh, reach out to us, and uh, you know, we can uh, you know, start these conversations with uh, your company. And um, we'd be, uh, again, glad to, uh, you know, discuss, uh, you know, the use in your application. All right, it doesn't look like we have any new questions in. Um, I'd like to thank our presenters, Mike and Tim, and our sponsor, Pills Automation Safety. Um, as a reminder, if you registered as a group, please add the names and emails of all in attendance on the exit survey. On behalf of EHS Today, have a productive remainder of the day.